It was July 2007, and the dry New Mexico heat could shrivel your average outsider into the size of a small keychain. Melinda and Bailey, two young women dressed in impeccable costumes of the Harry Potter characters Luna Lovegood and Hermione Granger, were getting ready for a momentous mm -hmm. event. The release of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, the final installment in the epic saga of the boy wizard and his quest to defeat the evil Lord Voldemort. They, like so many other cosplaying fans, had driven out to Page One Books, an exquisite bookstore in the very heart of Albuquerque. It was miles from where the two of them had lived, but more than worth the drive to be part of the Potterhead fever. Long before the series author would lose her mind on Twitter and make the books a lot harder for most people to enjoy. Trans rights, by the way. Bailey and Melinda were counting the seconds until the bookstore's doors finally opened, and they could get the answers to so many of their burning questions. Why had Snape killed Dumbledore? Would Harry, Ron, and Hermione find and destroy the last few Horcruxes, allowing them to finally destroy Lord Voldemort once and for all? And most importantly of all, would their ships sail? Mel was Harry Hermione all the way, but Bailey, controversially, was all about Ron and Draco. The two of them couldn't be more excited to be part of literary history like this. The bookstore's doors opened, and little by little, the line fed in. It was worth the long drive in the late evening and facing the sweltering summer heat. When the two of them were holding copies of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows and walking back to their car, they knew it had all been worth it. Mel thought, this must have been how Jesus felt when he finished writing the first edition of the Old Testament. History, incidentally, had never been Mel's strong suit. Melinda and Bailey set off back to their homes in the sticks. Bailey was driving. She'd been kind enough to give Mel a lift, knowing they were probably their neighborhood's biggest Potterheads. It warmed their hearts to see all this enthusiasm for the book series they loved so fondly. Seeing so many others in costume, or with vinyl decals or bumper stickers in their cars declaring their love of the franchise. They'd seen Hagrid grabbing a mocha in Starbucks, Mad-Eyed Moody had been filling up his Buick at the Gas and Gulp, and Cirrus Black had passed out from heat stroke and needed to be attended to medically. With an all-black costume in this kind of weather, that much was basically inevitable. As Bailey and Melinda continued their drive, drawing closer to the witchy wilderness of Cibola National Forest, they continued sharing their thoughts, feelings, and predictions about the book to come. They couldn't wait to read it. Was it even possible for someone to be this amped about a book? Their enthusiasm was so great, they didn't even notice, on those long, winding back roads, that another car had started following them. It was 8.15 p.m. now, pitch black, the kind of darkness where bad things happen. Evidently, during a lull in the conversation, Mel turned her eyes up to the rearview mirror and spotted the car behind them. It was a car they'd recognize anywhere, a turquoise blue Ford Anglia 105E. To some, this would be a mostly unrecognizable, if a little old-fashioned car, but to Melinda and Bailey, it could only ever be the enchanted vehicle of Arthur Weasley, the father of series mainstay Ron Weasley. The car, which had become iconic since being featured in the books and films, was able to fly and turn invisible, and had gotten the main characters both into and out of a variety of amusing scrapes. Mel told Bailey to take a look, and she couldn't help but chuckle in admiration. Plenty of Harry Potter fans were in town tonight, and some took it further than others. At times, Bailey wondered if her three Harry Potter bumper stickers reading, My Other Ride is a Nimbus 2000, Save Gas, Take the Night Bus, and All Aboard the Hogwarts Express, respectively, were a little excessive. And then there was whoever this was, whose intense Harry Potter fandom led them to buy an authentic Harry Potter car. Neither Bailey nor Mel could make out the driver. The car's windshield was slightly fogged up. Strange. Strange, seeing as it was such a hot evening out. They noticed that the car also must have had broken turn signals, because any time the car needed to make a turn, the driver's arm would slide out the window and make the appropriate gesture. The Ford Anglia kept pace with them, following them at every single turn. It was only then that they noticed something a little odd. The car didn't have a license plate. It was almost as though all identifying features for the car or its driver had been obscured. Bailey, who was getting a little nervous at this point, decided to try out a little experiment. At the next three intersections, she took three left turns. It seemed improbable that anyone would actually intend to take a route that would lead them in a circle, and yet the Ford Anglia did just that. 
Bailey's most frightening suspicion was confirmed. They were being followed. She didn't need to tell Melinda, seeing as the bad vibes radiating off the car were already palpable. The two assessed their options. They couldn't drive home. After all, the last thing you'd want is a crazy person knowing where you live. Their best bet was to drive to a heavily populated area, say the center of Albuquerque during one of the most highly anticipated book launches in recent memory, or better yet, the local police station. Whoever was driving this car wouldn't dare try anything there. Bailey and Melinda sped up and took off in the direction of the city, but to their horror, the Ford Anglia sped up in kind. Bailey was pressing the gas pedal down to the floorboards, and still the Ford Anglia gained, its headlights glowing like menacing white eyes. In an instant, it pulled ahead of them, the driver's hand emerging once again. This time, it signaled for them to stop. The two of them would sooner drive their car off a cliff than stop for whoever was behind the murky front window of the Ford Anglia. As the Ford began to slow, perhaps hoping to box them in, Bailey pounded on the gas again and lurched forward, weaving around the Ford and passing it once more. The two copies of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows were rattling around in the back seats. Neither Bailey nor Melinda expected this night to end in a car chase, but it wouldn't be the last time their expectations would be dashed before sunrise. The two Potterheads were in the lead again, but it would still be seven or eight miles before they were officially out of Cibola National Forest. Bailey drove as fast as she could. She and Melinda were frantic messes of terror and adrenaline now, but the Ford Anglia kept moving, gaining on them with every second that passed. Go faster, goddammit, faster! Melinda screamed in horror. I'm going as fast as I can! Bailey yelped back. The car merged into the lane next to them and sped forward again. They were neck and neck now, but it was still too dark inside the other car to make out the driver. Just as Mel was wishing that she could have a closer look, her wish was granted in the worst way possible. The Ford Anglia abruptly moved to the side and slammed against them, knocking them off course with a sudden shocking blow. The shock knocked Bailey sideways in the car and yanked the steering wheel along with them. The car veered off the side of the road and tumbled down the grassy embankment towards the trees, taking the two unfortunate Potterheads down with it. Before they knew it, their fender was wrapped around the trunk of a ponderosa pine tree. If it wasn't for their seatbelts and airbags, they would have died instantly. But perhaps in the end, that would have been a mercy. Melinda and Bailey sat up as the airbags deflated in front of them. The car was totaled. As the two of them shakily unbuckled their seatbelts and climbed out of the car, they were bathed in the light of the Ford Anglia's headlights from above, as though they were about to be abducted by a UFO's tractor beam. The Ford was just waiting on the road above them. Its engine rumbled like a low, bestial growl. The driver was still obscured behind the foggy windshield but their arm was hanging out of the window once more. Bailey and Melinda were too frightened and dazed by the crash to even move as the car began advancing with unnatural grace down the embankment before them. It clambered towards them with such uncanny intent that it seemed almost like it had a mind of its own, rather than a machine being piloted by a human being. Melinda pointed forwards and screamed. She saw something Bailey didn't. There was something on the outstretched palm of the driver's hand. She thought it was a tattoo at first until she saw it move. Two human eyes were fixed into the center of the flesh, staring directly at her, like a crustacean's eyes on stalks. Moments later, the car was upon them, and Melinda's scream was silenced. A concerned passerby found Bailey's abandoned car crashed in the ditch beside the road the next morning. The two women were never found, and two bashed-up copies of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows were discovered on the car's floor among all the shards of broken glass, never to be read. Some days can be magical, just not in the ways you would have hoped, especially if you run afoul of SCP-3470, a Euclid-class anomaly somewhat cruelly nicknamed Harry Potter's Revenge. Sadly, kidnappings and car accidents aren't that uncommon in this strange, scary world we live in, but at a certain point, the SCP Foundation's many field agents detected a strange pattern in a series of car accidents near Cibola National Forest in New Mexico. In all these instances, the cars had been found crashed, but there were never any bodies. Eagle-eyed police officers studying the crash also picked up another more subtle detail in all these events. The cars had turquoise blue paint chips on them, even if the cars themselves weren't blue suggesting the impact of another car. Foundation eggheads correlated this with another strange report they'd received out of New Mexico. A young couple had narrowly avoided a dangerous incident when a car matching the description of a classic Ford Anglia 105E tried to flag them down on a dark and lonely road. 
near Cibola National Forest. Just like Bailey and Melinda, the duo were unable to see the driver behind the fogged up windshield. However, when they got close enough to see the driver's hand, they both attested that it had eyes on its palm, describing it as similar to the terrifying Pale Man from the movie Pan's Labyrinth. With all of these frightening and clearly anomalous data points in place, the SCP Foundation decided it was time to do their due diligence and go on the hunt for this predatory car. It wouldn't be the first time they'd tackled a sadistic or carnivorous vehicle, and because of this experience, they weren't going in unprepared. There was, of course, SCP-2086, also known as the Man-Eating Bus. These were a species of huge insect-like creatures who'd evolved to perfectly mimic your average city bus in order to lure prey into their bodies. Another notable instance was SCP-1386, also known as the Living Ice Cream Van. This being is even more mysterious than the man-eating buses, and boasts a wide range of abilities from a hazardous form to a fleshy appendage, somewhat similar to the arm emerging from SCP-3470. The jury's still out on whether either of these anomalies are in any way directly connected to SCP-3470, but it gave the SCP Foundation a few ideas on how exactly to engage, study, and potentially even contain this new vehicular slaughterer of man. As you've probably come to expect by this point, where there are still so many unknown variables involved, the Foundation decided to fall back on Old Faithful, throwing a couple of D-classes at it and just seeing what happened. Two were selected, placed in a standard Foundation off-road vehicle with dash and rear cams, and given a variety of equipment, including a special semi-automatic assault rifle with armor-piercing rounds, each one containing a micro-GPS that would allow the Foundation to continue tracking SCP-3470 after initial contact. And if, in the process of the experiment, SCP-3470 revealed some frightening new powers, then a standard vehicle and a pair of D-classes weren't much of a loss. Once again, another hapless duo were sent off on the roads in the proximity of Cibola National Park, though the Foundation hoped these two would at least end the night accounted for. They patrolled the roads, once or twice remarking on the beauty of the stars above, while not much of anything happened. Command kept close tabs on them back at the nearest containment site, feeding orders through earpieces and watching the live video feeds. As the drive continued, the two D-classes finally encountered SCP-3470. They get closer, at which point SCP-3470 begins its typical pattern of hunting behavior. It merged onto the road next to the D-class vehicle and began to slide alongside them. That's when the two D-classes realized, and couldn't help but remark, that this looked just like the car from Harry Potter. Was Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry a new group of interests now? Had Lord Voldemort entered into an allegiance with the Scarlet King? This was hilarious. Of course, it didn't remain all that funny to the D-classes for long. The anomalous Ford Anglia suddenly pulled up in front of them and ground to an abrupt halt, forcing the D-class driving to pound the brakes, startling both of them. That's when the human arm slithered out from the Anglia's open window and made the stop signal, before twisting around and revealing the two staring human eyes embedded in its palm. The D-classes started to panic and reverse away, while the car started chasing them at terrifying speeds. Foundation Command kept ordering the D-class riding shotgun to live up to his title and blast the vehicle with one of the tracking bullets, but the driver was so terrified he refused to slow down and give his fellow D-Class a clear shot. As a result, the armed D-Class released a flurry of shots and just got lucky that some of them happened to strike the car. This caused it to let out a terrible pain shriek, comparable to the squeal of breaking car tires. SCP-3470 then retreated, allowing the D-Classes to safely return to base while Command tracked the Ford Anglia back to its native habitat. It was time for the next phase of the mission to begin. The Foundation brought in Mobile Task Force Lambda-12, also known as the Pest Controllers, a group of operatives who specialize in taking down particularly verminous creatures. They'd be the ones to track down SCP-3470's nest and find out what they were really up against here. In order to complete the mission, four members of the task force were designated for infiltration, while two others were designated to keep watch outside. The infiltrators were given reinforced armor and a wide selection of weapons and tools, including a flamethrower, a tranquilizer gun, a net gun, and a light machine gun. SCP-3470's movements were tracked back to a cave in Cibola National Forest. When the infiltration team entered, they saw track marks with a familiar tire tread on the floor and walls of the cave, 
which suggested a number of frightening things about the anomaly they were chasing. As they got deeper into the cave, the air became intensely hot and humid. They found scat piles filled with human bones and a local sheriff's badge, suggesting that the car does indeed eat and digest its prey. But most terrifying of all, the infiltration team discovered a number of translucent eggs, which had small quadrupedal organisms assumed to be the larval stage of SCP-3470 wriggling away inside. They collected some of the eggs and then burned the rest before turning around to leave. That's when they noticed that SCP-3470 was in the cave mouth, waiting for them. Except this one wasn't turquoise like the other. This one was black. The car began revving aggressively. After a tense standoff in which one of the task force members muttered, I refuse to be killed by a goddamn Ford. The task force member with the light machine gun opened fire on the car's exposed arm. One of the bullets hit the creature in one of its hand eyes, causing it to let out another pain shriek and retreat from the cave mouth, allowing the task force to finally escape. The two who were meant to be on the lookout were never seen again. SCP-3470 remains at large, with the pest controllers doing whatever they can to track it down and contain it. The eggs are also subject to further study. In the meantime, be careful who you stop for because if you end up inside this magical Ford Anglia, an encounter with the Whomping Willow is going to be the least of your worries. Now go check out SCP-1958 Magic Bus and Living Ice Cream Van SCP-1386 for more villainous vehicles from the world of the SCP Foundation.